If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 15, verses 29 through 33. Matthew chapter 15. Starting with verse 29, the Bible reads, Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. Then the word of God says, and he laid them at his feet. He laid them at his feet, cast all of your cares at his feet. And he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled uh, made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to be in your space where your Holy Spirit can reach our hearts, convict us, challenge us, inspire us. And Father, we want that today. We are casting all of our cares at your feet. Have compassion on us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen and amen. This takes place in Matthew chapter 15. Do you know what took place in Matthew chapter 14 that was very similar to this situation? It was the feeding of the 5,000. Now, many of you who do not know this assumed after reading this passage that that's where I was going. But this is not the feeding of the 5,000. This is the feeding of the 4,000. Some of y'all didn't know about that, did you? This was the feeding of the 4,000. And, and, and just for a little bit of context here, in chapter 15, Jesus was trying to get away after hearing that his cousin had been killed. And he went to a lonely place, Matthew says. And, and before the advent of social media, people knew where Jesus was going. They knew he was going to this remote place, and they all showed up. Now, the Bible says that he fed 5,000 men on that day, not including women and children. 5,000 men, not including women and children. It was Matthew's way of saying that Jesus fed 5,000 households. So the feeding of the 5,000 most likely wasn't actually 5,000 people. It was more like 15,000 people, maybe even 20,000 people. And the disciples witnessed this. In fact, after this miracle, the people wanted to crown Jesus the King, the Messiah. They had seen enough. This miracle was next level. Christ can multiply things out of thin air. Can you imagine what he could do with those powers if they were to fight against Rome? Jesus could multiply people most likely. If he can do fish, I'm sure he can do people. We can take out the Roman army. If one of us falls in battle, he'll raise them up. If we get hungry, he can feed them. This was enough evidence, but Christ dispersed the crowd and sent them away. Now in chapter 15, Christ is entire in Sidon, and this is where he is confronted by the Syrophoenician woman or Canaanite woman, a Gentile who is asking for Jesus to help her out because her daughter is very ill. She says, son of David, have mercy on me. This is when Jesus says, it's not right to take the food and throw it to the dogs. Remember that? Yeah, that's another sermon for another day. But this woman has such great faith, she persists, and so Christ gives her exactly what she's asking for. And it's after that moment that Jesus leaves and he went along the Sea of Galilee. What makes this story a little bit different from chapter 14 of Matthew is most likely the majority of Jesus' crowd is probably Gentiles. It's just because of the area that he was in. 
he, he most likely has a Gentile crowd, a crowd that's a little bit different than the 5,000 households that he fed in 14. But what shocks me about this text is that after Jesus does almost exactly what he does in 14, healing people, preaching and teaching, except this time he does it for three days instead of just one day. For three days he's ministering to these people, healing their sick. They're casting all of their cares at his feet. And he has compassion on them and he heals them. And then he tells the disciples, I don't just have compassion to restore them back to wholeness, but I have compassion so that they don't go home on an empty stomach. Now I would think that if I were blind and I was healed, I could deal with some hunger. If I've been dealing with being uh, uh, paralyzed, <laughs> For most of my life, I can deal with an empty stomach and make it back home. But Jesus has so much compassion for us, family, that he doesn't even want us to experience this. And this is so critical here, and I, I, I don't want you to miss this point, because Christ cares so much about people simply being full. I say this because we are so comfortable with people going hungry. As a church, we are absolutely comfortable with people going hungry. In fact, many times when we see people asking for money or asking for food, we'll come up with some reasons why they are probably hungry. You know what, they're going to use this money on drugs. The reason why they don't have a job right now is they're probably a drug abuser. How many times have you recited a narrative to excuse you from being helpful to people? Hello? How many times? I don't know what they're going to do with this money. Do you know I'm so glad that when Jesus healed those people, he didn't say, I don't know what they're going to do with those new legs. I'm probably not going to heal them. I don't know what he's going to do with those eyes. I'm not sure which websites he's going to visit. I'm not going to give him sight. I'm so glad that Jesus does good for the sake of simply doing good. And how people choose to handle that gift is on them. But we don't have to be, we don't have to be the police. We don't have to be the, the judge and jury. We don't have to be the one that, that, that holds them to the fire to make sure they spend every penny that we've blessed them with the appropriate way. You want to know why? Because we don't do that ourselves. Boy, if I could go into your bank account right now, the stuff I would find. Jesus blesses people. He does this because he is good and because he has compassion. And that is what God has asked us to do. Now, I know someone's going to say, but pastor, I have some members who are abusers, and I know they're going to use that money for drugs. Yes, you might be in situations where you do not want to enable people. Those are specific situations. God is not calling us to be enablers. But in situations where you do not know their history, do not know their story, it is not for you to, to use conjecture and say, I don't know what they're going to do with it, so I'm not going to do anything at all. Be helpful, be compassionate, be a blessing. Amen? Amen? All right, we're good. So this is what Jesus does. He has compassion on them. He doesn't want them to go home hungry. But this is what really gets me. This is what really gets me. He tells the disciples he doesn't want them to go home. And their response in verse 34, I mean in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, verse, I'm sorry, verse 33, they said, where can we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? This is a question they have after chapter 14 situation. Now, they've already seen Jesus do some pretty miraculous things with some fish and some loaves, and also in a remote place, and feeding a crowd that is much larger than the crowd they are with right now. And they fix their mouth to say, uh, <laughs> Where are we going to get enough bread, Jesus? This is most likely just weeks after the feeding of the 5,000. For sure, it's, it's not more than a year. And even if it were a year, could you ever forget feeding of the 5,000 with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Could you? These are things we could never forget. It's the reason why this story is recorded in, in, in the Gospels. 
So this question that they have, it harkens back to the time when God was leading his children out of captivity, out of Egypt, and through the wilderness for 40 years. How often did the people complain about food? How often did they complain about too much gluten? How often did they complain about having, not having enough water? They were constantly complaining, even though God, time and time again, was showing that he cares about their needs. Bread was falling from the sky. Water was coming out of rocks. God was constantly a God of provision, and they still found time to complain and to doubt and to question. And this is what's happening in this story. The disciples are actually questioning how they're going to have enough bread to feed everybody. How do we get there, fam? How do we get there? Some of you now in your 30s are questioning if what you have been taught all along is actually true. Many of you who have seen God get you through some tough times. You have some faith stories about how you were able to get through school. You had no reason, no right, no way possible to go through four years of school. You didn't have the money, you didn't, you, you didn't have the resources, you didn't have the family support, and yet you were able to get through school. You had miracle stories where someone gave you money without being asked. You found something in the mail you were not expecting. God showed up for you, and you were able to get through. Some of you say, well, I got through because of school loans. But some of y'all experienced recently getting those school loans forgiven. Amen? Amen. I only had like 10000 more to spend, but it disappeared. I was being faithful, too. I wasn't faithful my first 10 years out of school. I was, I was, I was reckless. With that money initially, I started getting a paycheck. I'm like, I'm not paying back this loan. It'll, it'll just be there for later. But then it started, it started growing. I, I was financially irresponsible to start off in life. But watch this, watch this. I started being faithful, and I was systematic in my, in, in my giving. And I was like, I was looking forward to I'm like, two more years, and I'll finally be done. And then one day, I'm not sure who, which president was in office. Who should I, who should I think, Trump or Biden? <laughs> Biden. Oh, you weren't ready for that. I'm not being political. I'm just being, I'm, I'm just showing gratitude. Amen? So, so one day I get this email saying, it's all been forgiven. And you know I was a little disappointed because I wanted the, 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 the credit for actually being so committed and paying off my school loans. I was like, but I was almost done. And then something said, John, are you serious? Just be, just be thankful, right? So, 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 so we, we, we have stories of how God has come through for us. But in your 30s, you're going through some relationship issues, and now you're wondering if God even listens, if he ever even cared. And some will get to the point, does he even exist? This is such a challenge because watch this. Faith, faith is a resource that gets depleted. Faith is a resource that gets depleted. It, it, is, it, is, it is one of those things that if you're not feeding it, if you're not focusing on it, if you're not nurturing it, it disappears. And this is why so many people in Scripture who, 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 were, who were faith giants can go through moments where it seems like they don't believe at all. Remember when we did our, uh, the, the series Heart of a Champion? Remember how much faith David had to beat Goliath? Remember that? The faith to take out a lion, the faith to take out a bear, the faith to, to not kill Saul, even when it was in his power, he just trusted that God would do as he said he would do. But after a couple of years on the run for his life, David says, Saul's going to kill me. Saul's going to kill me. The best thing for me to do is to run to the Philistines for protection. Was that a moment of faith for David? How about John the Baptist, who Jesus says is the greatest man ever born of a woman? Even after almost a year in prison, he begins to doubt and questions if Jesus truly is the Lamb of God. The one who said that Christ was, that, that he was unworthy to, to lace Christ's sandals has a moment where he's questioning if Jesus is even the Messiah, the Son of God. If we're not nurturing, nurturing it, if we're not careful, our faith can be depleted. 
And this is why it's so interesting to see the disciples in this situation because they're so much like us. It is not about what has God done for us. It's always what has God done for us lately. Do you believe that the God who blessed you in chapter 14 can bless you in chapter 15? Do you believe the God that helped you through your teen years can get you through your 20s and your 30s? The God who who helps sustain you in your 40s and your 50s, that he can get you through your 60s and your 70s. Do you believe that the God that had your back yesterday will be the same God that will have your back today and tomorrow? What's so critical about this topic is that if you look at Scripture, everyone has these moments where they lack faith. Even if you look at the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, And as much as the author wants to celebrate their moments of victory, I can tell you Abraham, Samson, we just did a series on him, had moments where they lacked faith. Abraham lacking faith is why we are dealing with the issues between Israel and the Palestinians today. Do you know that? Abraham's lack of faith is the reason why we are still dealing with wars over land. Because he had the bright idea to take matters into his own hands. How will we get this bread? How will we have enough? Verse 34 says, Christ says, ask the question, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. Now, how many loaves did they have in chapter 14? Five loaves. So now they have more loaves to feed a crowd that is smaller than the one in chapter 14. But if you notice their response, seven, it's almost like they already feel defeated. Now watch this. They said, we have seven and we have some fish. But what kind of fish do they have? (laughs) Small fish. See, Jesus, the fish you used last time were a little bit bigger. These are small. These are the morning star fish, the little breakfast sausages. They're tiny, not big franks. Little, small, almost as if to discourage Jesus. It's not enough, bro. I know what you did last time, but you were working with more. You had the Moses lunch bell. We don't have any lunch bell this time. So this is what he tells them. This is what they tell him. And, and, and Jesus' response to this, and this is important, Jesus' response to this is, in verse 35, is he told the crowd to sit down on the ground. So they tell him it's small, right? They tell him it's small. This is what we have, and Jesus says, sit down. Let me ask you this question. Is it enough for Jesus? If they had a tail of an eaten fish, would it be enough for Jesus? If they had no fish and no bread, would it be enough for Jesus? Absolutely. But Christ always asks us what we have because he's always calling us to participate in the blessing. He's always going to ask you what you have. What do you have in your hand? How much do you have? You have uh, uh, what, the little eyelash? I'll take the eyelash. We're going to do something with this. What do you have? Some lint? Give me that lint. We're going to, in your pocket. Come on, let's do this. What do you have? All right, you ate the, okay, it's uncrustable. Okay, I got it. All right, so you don't have the crust. I'll take the sandwich. Whatever you have, we're going to work with it. Because whatever we have in Jesus' hands, and this is what is so important because often we'll tell God, I don't have enough to go forward. I don't have enough to succeed. I don't have enough to go another week. I'm done. I can't stay in this relationship any longer. Lord, I have to get out. And let me tell you something right now. This is for some of the couples out here. Let me tell you something. The strength that you would need in order to survive that broken relationship, the strength you need in order to survive that divorce is the same strength that he can give you to work it out. I've often sat in front of couples, and they said, no, I can't do this anymore. I said, I just want you to know what's, what's in store if you decide to split. It's going gonna, it's gonna to break you. It's going to hurt. It's gonna, this will be the most difficult thing you've ever had to go through. I can do it. Oh, you can. I can do it. If you can do that, you might be able to do a whole, a whole lot more in this relationship. 
The same faith that it requires to get through that storm of divorce or breakup, that transition, is the same, same God who can calm that storm in the situation. Now, I know there might be some situations that are unworkable because of the person that you may be with, but that's not what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about those who give up because the mountain looks too big, the giant looks too big, the walls look unscalable. I'm talking about those who give up because they know they're about to go in a lion's den. I'm telling you right now, when you have faith that you nurture and that you feed and you trust the God in chapter 14 to do what he, you knew he did in 14 that he can do in 15 and 16, you can face those lion's dens. You can face those fiery furnaces. You can look at the walls of Jericho and it might look like a six foot chain link fence when you're done with it. Too many of us give up because our fish are small. We give up because we only have seven pieces of bread. We give up because, Lord, you did it in 14, but you're not going to do it again. You're going to do it again. You already gave me a solid. You already gave me a big miracle. You're going to come through for me again? And the answer is yes, yes, he'll do it again. Oh, and the way, what, Sister Shirley Caesar? Come on, some of y'all know some, some old school gospel. Isn't that what she says? She says, you may not know how, you may not know when, but he'll do it again. Oh, I need to teach y'all. We need more black up in here, amen? He'll do it again. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know that he'll do it again. And I need you to understand this. The same God that can do the big miracles is the same God that can do the small miracles. The same God that can heal you of blindness is the same God that will make sure you go home on a full stomach. He cares about every need in your life. It matters to him. And what it requires on our end is to trust so he tells us, what do you have? Whatever you have, family, give it to him. Whatever you have, give it to him. But I only have a little bit. Give him the little bit that you have. But you don't understand, I have really small faith. Give him what you have. Because little becomes much in whose hands? In the master's hands. That's another song. You're about to get me to sing now. So he tells them to sit down, and this is important here. The crowd knows what's about to come. They know that they're sitting down for a reason, and if they chose not to sit down because it seemed, it seemed improbable that they could ever be fed by a few loaves and some fish, some small fish, they would have just walked home. No, we, we ain't sitting down. Please, we going home. There's a Taco Bell on the way. No, 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 no. They sit down. And why do they sit down, family? Why do they sit down? Why do they sit down? They sit down because they are preparing to eat. They're sitting down to prepare to eat something that's not even before them at the moment. They sit down in preparation to receive a blessing they cannot see with their own eyes at the time. They sit down because it is their act of faith to sit down. Many of us will never experience the provisions that God has for us because we refuse to sit. He tells us to do something. I can't do it, Lord. I can't stay another month. Sit down. I can't, Lord. I can't. There's no, there's no way I'm going to send my kid to, to, to Glendale Avenue Academy. I can barely make the mortgage. I can't sit down. But Lord, if you, you don't understand here, if, if this doesn't go right, I feel like I'm going to lose my mind. I'm going to do it my way. I'm just, I'm just, I'm going to use my own default mode. I'm going to use what pleases me. I'm going to use my own painkillers. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get me through this moment. Sit down. You know how many times many of us move instead of sitting? We're just restless. I gotta go, I gotta do something. I, I, it's not gonna work out and we panic. Our anxiety gets the best of us. And God is saying, I know that you're anxious, but remember what I did for you in chapter 14 and remember what I just did for you. You're able to walk now, sit. Don't you want me to use my legs? Sit. 
And this is important, family, because without sitting, without sitting, without sitting, we're never going to be able to eat. And this is really critical. God expects us in these moments of miracles to have a part that we play in it. Watch what happens here. He tells them to sit, and then he took the seven loaves in verse 36 and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples and in turn to the people. I love this part because the disciples who know the people are hungry, and they're hungry themselves because they haven't eaten in three days, they are now able to be partakers in the miracle of feeding the 4,000. This is important because God, every time he does a miracle in Scripture, he's always asking for participation every single time. Every single time. I, there's not one miracle that I can find where God is not asking, Moses, what do you have in your hand? <laughs> right? Lift it up. Stretch it forth. He's always asking us to participate. And this is important because miracles happen through participation. Faith itself is participatory. This is why Hebrews 11 says this. It's so, it's so powerful. Hebrews 11 verse 1. We know this story. We know this verse very well. I like the King James the best. That faith is the substance of things what? The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not yet seen. This is critical. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not yet seen. This means that faith has substance. This is why James says that faith without works is dead. So this is so critical. When we say we believe, it's because we trust God and he knows that we believe and everyone else around us will know that we believe because we're doing. We're sitting. We're passing out. We're sharing. We have compassion. We're giving. We're serving. Faith always expresses itself in actions. Always expresses itself in in actions. You can never say, no, I just believe and no one else can see it. If you believe, we can't help but see it because faith has substance. And it is evidence of things not yet seen. And so the disciples get involved. Get involved. Get involved in that miracle that you're seeking. Get involved in that blessing that you want. Get involved. You're asking the Lord to help you out but don't work against him helping you out, amen? I know many people that are like, oh, I just, I'm, I'm looking for that right relationship, and then they're in the wrong places. Hello? Lord, I just want this to all work out. I just, I know you don't want me to be alone, but you're, 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 you're searching in the wrong places, and you're accepting behaviors that you know are toxic. And so God is like, I'm trying to help you out, but you're working against my blessing. I just want to be healthy, Lord. I just want you to heal me of what's going on here. I want you, well, well, can we take a look at the refrigerator? Hello? You're praying for health while working against your own health. Amen? Oh, you don't want this one. Never mind. That's another sermon, another time. My, my, my point is this. My point is this. God can heal, and he will do that, but you can't be working against it. it, it it's, it's counterintuitive. So, Lord, I'm praying for health. God says, great, let's look inside your cupboards. Let's work on this together. No, no, I want you just to wave your hand over it. No, we're not going to tackle diabetes that way. <laughs> we're going to do it, we're going to do it my way. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, just do the little, you know, nose flicker or whatever, the I dream of genie thing. Just do something to make it quick. No, 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 this is the process, and we're going to do this the right way. It's going to take time. It's going to take courage. It's going to take faith. But let's do it right. Let's do it well. The Bible says in verse 37, the first part says, they ate and they all were what? Ha. Amen? They all were satisfied. God wants to satisfy you. Do you believe that? Oh, no. As a Christian, he just wants us to be burdened down. He wants, us, he wants suffering. No, no. He wants you to be satisfied. That's why he says in Isaiah 55, all who are thirsty and hungry, come to me and I will give you that which satisfies. Why spend your money on what does not satisfy? Come to me and you will have the best food of all. God has always wanted to satisfy you. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And if you eat the bread of life, you will live. God has always wanted to satisfy. John 15, I tell you all these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be 
complete. Jesus didn't come to this earth for us to be miserable. He came to this earth for us to experience joy, for us to have peace, for us to experience life the way he originally designed it. If he came into this world so we could be more burdened down, that would be counterintuitive. He says, no, take my burden up on you, for it is light and my yoke is easy. Amen? He wants us to be satisfied. Later on in verse 37, it says, Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Can I tell you something? When God is done with you, you're going to have leftovers. <laughs> Hello? When God is done with you, you're going to have leftovers. He always shows up this way. There's so many stories all throughout the scripture where God shows up this way, where he blesses you in such abundance that you have leftovers to bless others. Somebody say amen on that. In other words, you're not just going to squeak by. You're not just going to get by. He's going to do it so that you are full and you are satisfied and that you will be able to help others be full and others be satisfied. Amen? In fact, I believe that some of us, because we have kept the blessings to ourselves, or we become so self-centered and so selfish that we're not sharing, that it actually contributes to our depression and our, and our, and our, and our heartache and our, and our loneliness and our depression. I think that we're designed to give. We're designed to participate. We're designed to share. And if you're not experiencing joy, happiness, and satisfaction, I would tell you right now, open up your wallet. I'll tell you right now, give your time to those in need. I'll tell you right now, go feed somebody. I, ooh, I challenge you. Just go feed somebody. Find somebody with a sign that doesn't even make any sense to you. And say, I want to bless you with something from Chipotle. I'm telling you, try it out. And their story may not make sense. And they may not be coherent, but you know what? They're going to be satisfied today. Amen? Because God satisfies us, our response is to also satisf satisfy others. And in verse 38, it says, The number of those who ate was found 4,000 men besides women and children. Oh, so it wasn't 4,000 people alone. It was 4,000 households. This is more like 12, 15,000. This is what's interesting. God, God sees numbers that you cannot see. God understands the mathematics, the physics. He understands the science behind everything so that when you come to him with your problem, there is nothing that is too big for him. We may, we, we may say, Lord, it's just this one little problem with my knee. It's just so, can you help me out? And God says, actually, it's, it's deeper than your knee. I, I know what you're asking for, but I can see, I have x-ray vision. I can see what the CAT scans can't see, what the MRIs cannot see. And I'm telling you right now, I'm going to make sure I take care of everything. No no stone will be unturned. You will be satisfied. You will be blessed. And because of that, you will bless others. And what he does for us, family, has a numerical impact for generations to come. He's not just blessing 4,000. He's blessing 15,000, 20,000. And those 20,000 that are blessed, you know what? They have a testimony. And when they share with others, guess who, more, guess who else is blessed? The other 15, 20,000 that hear about this and know that they can call on God in the same way that you called upon God. Can you imagine an entire world that has this a part of their DNA? They believe that God will come through. I believe that if we can embrace these principles, these, these Christian ideals, we won't have any more wars. Oh, I know, we got some Christian nationalists here. That when we embrace these Christian principles, we embrace, embrace these ideologies, that we find ways, solutions, so that we don't have what's happening between the, the, the Ukraine and Russia or between Gaza and, and, and Israel. We, we, we figure this thing out and we'll do it with compassion and we'll make sure that everyone is satisfied. I'm not running for office. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about what he's capable of doing. And family, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. When we have these moments where we go, oh, that's too big, pastor. Oh, come on. You're trying to change the world. Oh, that's pie in the sky. This is why we end up where we are. We don't believe that God can do the great thing. 
He told Peter, up on this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He says to Peter, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. He gives, he gives Peter the keys to do great things. And you know that rock that he built his church on is the same rock in Daniel chapter 2. And what did that rock do to the nations in, in Daniel chapter 2? Where are my prophecy students here? What did that rock do in chapter 2 of Daniel? It took out that statue that represented all the nations, and in its place, it grew until it filled the whole earth. The rock of ages filled the whole earth. The church filled the whole earth. The gates of hell could not prevail against what God was doing in his people, and, and world hunger was, was solved. Is that even possible? Sex trafficking came to an end. Is that even possible? Is it possible? If it's possible, family, then we begin to live like it's possible. We sit down. What Jesus did in the past, he will do it again. What Jesus has done in the past, he will do it again. He will heal people. He will save people. He will do it again. What he did in chapter 14, he will do again in chapter 15. He will do it again. And if we believe that God can do it again, if we believe that he can part the Red Sea and knock down the walls that separate people, if we believe he can do that, he can do it again. He's just waiting on people who will sit down, people who will pick up their baskets, people who will do their part. I'm tired of sitting back and waiting for some lone wannabe hero to save us. I don't need a new president. I just need Jesus. I don't need a, a new party in office to solve all my problems. I need Jesus. And I believe that he can do it again. And he can restore families. And he can bring you back to where he has called you to be. And family, when a church is like that, watch out. Oh, Glendale's going to be in trouble. The enemy's going to be in trouble because we believe the God who did this in the past will do it again. If he can multiply food in that moment, can't he do it to, to, to feed the entire planet? Seventh-day Adventist Christians sit down because if we're sitting down, God will provide. And maybe it'll look like one day, we don't have a general conference session where we spend like 40, 50 million dollars to come together to vote. Maybe we spend that 50 million dollars and we make sure that no one is hungry. Hello? Do you believe that he can do it again, family? I believe that he can do it again. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this challenge that you've given us. We're going to trust you in this moment, in this space, to do it again. Father, we want that 4K type of faith that is so clear, that has so much substance, that gives evidence that we trust you. We knew what you could do with the 5K, we're going to trust you with the 4K. And if it's 15K, we're going to trust you with it. If it's 40K, we're going to trust you with it. If it's just a small fish, if it's a big fish, if it's no fish, we just trust that if you are behind it, whatever we have in our hand, even if it's a piece of lint, we know that you can multiply, that you can bless many. And that's what you've called us to do. We want to multiply. Multiply your followers, your disciples. We want to grow. We want to fill this planet so that one day there are no more wars. I know, I know, I know. We're, we're, we're hoping some president or some prime minister can do this. But you are our president. You are our Lord and Savior. And you've commissioned us to do this. That the gospel of the kingdom would go to the ends of the earth. We have 4K faith right now. We see clearly. Oh, Jesus, do it again. May your spirit go with us as we sit down. May your spirit go with us as we pass out baskets of grace and compassion to those in need. May we have something this week that we can focus on that is outside of ourselves so that we can help satisfy those in need and focus on the things that you've done that satisfy us. 
May we not forget what you did for us yesterday. Know what you're going to do for us today and have confidence of what you will do for us tomorrow. You will do it again. Bless your people as we go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.